Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just a few announcements today. Uh, we're going to continue with our process module coverage here at Lightspeed, uh, but just some announcements. Homework number two is online. Um, there was a version, an early version of it that came online, I think, uh, yesterday or the day before, but I changed problem number three. So if you downloaded that, download the latest version that's going to be online because problem number three is a bit different than the first one. This is not due till Tuesday, September 27th, which is two weeks from last lecture. So you have plenty of time to do this. Um, just a reminder of things that are occurring next week. So no office hours for me on Wednesday the 21st. This is because of the BSAC Industrial Advisory Board meeting. I'm a director of BSAC, so I have to be there for the whole time. Uh, no lecture, and so that means and th that meeting goes Wednesday and Thursday and actually Friday as well. So uh, no lecture next Thursday, uh, which is the 20, is it the 22nd? It is the 22nd, okay. And I've been trying to get a room for the 23rd, uh, but they have not told me whether or not there is an available classroom yet. And so I guess I'll either have to tell you which room and what time next Tuesday when there is lecture, or I have to email it out to you. Uh, but either way, we'll get some room at some point. If it can't be that Friday, then we'll do it you know, the next Monday or whenever it is. Again, for these makeup lectures, you don't, you know, you cannot be present if you cannot make that time. Maybe the time we get will intersect one of your classes or something else that you have to do. Uh, but you can always watch the lecture on webcast, okay, because I'll still be recording them. Um, I also said this last time, but this is going to be two weeks in a row that I cannot be here on Thursday. So even the Thursday after next Thursday, there will be no lecture. So there's lectures on Tuesdays. But no lectures on Thursdays, and there will be makeup lectures for those where I will be lecturing in person. If you can attend, you should. Uh, so you can ask whatever questions you want. But if not, you can at least uh, watch the webcast for these. Okay? Any questions about anything logistically? Yes? Where do we get our homeworks back? When do you get them back? And where? I will come with them to, to class, and so I'll hand them back to you. And if you're not in class when I do that, I will put them on, in the box outside of my office. Okay, but the homeworks will usually take a little bit of time to grade, so it's going to be you know, a week or something like that before you get them back. Any other questions? Okay, so again, we're going to go through those modules, uh, which are all online. So we were in the middle of doing lithography. We're going to finish this today. And then we're going to continue uh, now then talking about etching, both wet etching and dry etching. This is one of the more important topics for this class. If I can throw an exam problem at you that's nice and hairy, it could be an etching problem. Okay, so pay good attention here. And then we'll talk about doping, which is also something that is quite important in MEMS type processing, although not necessarily as important as it is in transistor type processing. Okay, so last time we were. Uh, going through lithography. And I thought I'd just start with this slide again, which we went through last time. This is basically saying that in lithography, there's four main components. There's the radiation source, which we talked about last time. Uh, there's the mask, which we talked about last time. There's the photoresist, which we talked about last time. And then there's the exposure system, which we're going to talk about right now. And so there are really three main types of exposure systems. There's what's called the contact aligner, a step aligner, a step and repeat aligner, um, and I guess I don't even have it listed here, but an almost contact aligner, so in close proximity, so proximity aligner. Let me get to those notes now. So this is where we left off last time. Um, and so what do I mean by the type of aligner? So this is an example of contact printing. So you have all the components here. I see a radiation source. You see your lens right here. Uh, that collimates that light going straight down to the mask. You assume we have a photoresist on this, but notice that this mask is in contact with the photoresist. Okay? And so logically it's called the contact aligner, contact printing. Okay? This is proximity printing. So this is where the mask is not quite touching the wafer and the photoresist here. Okay? So what about these two? So contact printing, mask in contact with the wafer. 
there's a problem with this, though, in that the mask pattern can become damaged with each exposure. Okay, so you're actually taking that mask pattern and putting it in contact with that photoresist. You do that enough times, right? Maybe you can get that pattern corrupted to some extent because photoresist may dry up and stick to that mask. You always wash the mask before you try to do these, but at some point you may end up with some problems when you've touched too many times. Anytime you're touching, something's going to change. Okay, and uh, for that reason, proximity printing is also available where you get as close as you can to the wafer. So this is a very tiny gap right here, maybe a microns type gap or something like that. But you never really touch the wafer. In that case, your mask will last a longer amount of time. Um, one times printing is very useful for MEMS. So this, all this contact printing that you're seeing, very useful for a lot of MEMS structures because in MEMS, uh, well, for a lot of MEMS devices, you don't need to have the type of lithographic resolution that transistors require. Right? So you know that there are 24 nanometer transistors now, that sort of thing. For MEMS, uh, what are the feature sizes, right? They're microns, sometimes they're 50 microns or so. Uh, so a lot of times there's no need for very aggressive resolution, except for research that's trying to get to very high frequency. So my type of research, which is vibrational resonators up in the tens of gigahertz or something like that, you need very good resolution for that. So you can't really use contact printing. But a lot of MEMS people will use contact printing because they don't care that much about lithography. Now that's kind of a nice thing when you're making a product because that means your process can be fairly inexpensive. You don't have to pay for these expensive masks. You don't have to pay for an expensive lithography tool. Okay, But if you need and another reason why MEMS like this is because if you look at this, right, the light's going straight down. And so there's going to be diffraction of light. Right? So you have to worry about that. But not enough diffraction here to go through the thickness of that photoresist. You actually can get some very good resolution out of contact lithography uh, if your photoresist is not too thick below this. Um, and so that's another reason why a lot of MEMS products like to use this. But if you need better performance, uh, then what you want is projection printing. So this is what's a step and repeat type system. So if you look at this thing, you have a light source. right? It may be diffracting here. But then you've got a lens that pushes it down onto the mask. It may come out again. And then you have a final lens here. But what you're seeing here is that your mask is bigger than the actual feature sizes that get onto the wafer. All right. And so if you require very good resolution, then one of the reasons why contact lithography doesn't make that much sense is because you have to actually get that same resolution on the mask. Right? And that is an expensive proposition. Okay, if you're doing projection lithography, now your mask, depending on what that reduction rate, right? so it's either 5 times or 10 times are very common here. If it's a 10 times reduction rate, then if you're trying to create a 1 micron feature on your actual substrate, your mask only has to be good to 10 microns. Okay? And so the mask becomes a lot cheaper to make uh, for those purposes. But then it, it ends up still being extremely expensive because usually you're trying to get you know, something ridiculously small, 34 nanometers, something like that. And 10 times that is still a very small number okay, to have to make a mask with. And so if you're going to expose just a tiny area of this wafer, okay, then that's where the step and repeat comes in. Because right? you can't expose the whole wafer. If you do contact lithography, you're exposing the whole wafer all at once. And it's very fast. Okay, so throughput in contact lithography can be extremely fast. But in uh, projection printing, where you're actually reducing the size to get to your actual wafer, uh, not the case. You have to do each die one at a time. And so what you do is you get your wafer in there and it steps and repeats. It'll expose, it'll expose, it'll expose. The exposures take only a second or just a few seconds or so. But uh, it will still take a lot longer than contact lithography will. In the end, though, you're much better off for many reasons. Okay, so what are some of these reasons? So I already talked about the mask. The minimum feature sizes can be larger, so the masks become cheaper. You're less susceptible to thermal variation in the mass than one times printing. And so what do I mean by this? So remember last time I was talking about, um, let me do this on the next slide here. A 
Okay, so last time I was talking about this case where you have a mask, well, you have a wafer. Okay, it's the right size. So say your wafer is right here. And you had some features on your wafer. And you wanted to do lithography over this wafer. And you wanted the next layer to be aligned to the layer that you have on this wafer. So you come in with a mask. And let's say we're talking about an 8-inch wafer or something like that. So maybe that's 8 inches across there. All right, so you have a mask here. You have a feature here that you wanted aligned to this. And at the right temperature, at the right temperature, everything is lined up. Right? But if you have just a one degree difference in temperature, things can go wrong. So here, say I have some kind of delta temperature that's been added to this. The temperature shifted away from the right temperature. Let's say right temperature is T naught. And so I could call this T naught plus delta T there. And what happens is this mask expands. And of course, I'm drawing this exaggerated versus that 8 inches. It doesn't have to expand very much, right? If it just expands, right, what's this feature size here? Say that's 1 micron here. If it expands 1 micron with that temperature shift, you're already missing this. Right? So if this, if this expansion right here is 1 micron out to that end, then this feature is going to be here. And you will completely miss okay. that's a big problem. Okay? And that's a problem you get with contact lithography. And so that's one of the reasons why you cannot do very good resolution and very good alignment with contact lithography. Now let's take a, a different case now. So if we're doing step and repeat, or projection printing. So this is contact. If instead we do projection printing, or projection lithography, now what's happening? Now we have a wafer, still the same size. We're no longer interested in aligning this feature to some feature all the way on the right of this wafer. Right? Now your wafer has individual dyes. Right? So maybe that's a die. That's another die. That's another die, so on and so forth. And you're really only interested in making sure that things on the dies actually align. So maybe I'm aligning to this here. So from the start, I'm not trying to align over 8 inches of wafer. Right? I'm trying to align over a much smaller die here, which may, in the end, only be one centimeter, which is oftentimes much smaller than that in transistor land. Okay? And on top of that, I'm not only trying to align just to one die, I'm actually trying to align a much larger mask something like this that will have a feature right there and a feature right here that are supposed to align to that. But I'm actually reducing this to a smaller size. right? So there's my reduction, x times reduction. Say I'll say 10 times reduction, where my drawing obviously is not to scale. But this is a reduction that's going on here. Okay? And so what about that reduction that's going on here? Well, this mass could be the same size as this 8 inches here, right? Or oftentimes it's a little small. It's going to be whatever it is, 10 times 1 centimeter is, right? It's going to be 10 centimeters wide here. So in this case, if that's a 1 centimeter die, then this mass better be at least 10 centimeters across, OK? And now what happens, right? So this is going to be a T naught, which is the right temperature. And so suppose we do the same thing to this. We add some delta T. That makes this mass expand. So exactly the same thing happens as with the mask above. This is expanding. This is going to come here. This is going to expand by that amount. 
right? And so this is going to miss versus, versus the, other, the first mask at the right temperature. This is going to miss that first mask, right, by a certain amount, right? But you don't care about missing that first mask, right? What you care about is what happens by the time everything is reduced here. So if this amount here moved, whoops, if that amount here was, say, one micron, then the actual amount of change that you see on the wafer, which is what you really care about, right, is a shift of one micron divided by 10, right? You've now reduced that amount of shift just because you've done this reduction there, okay? So there's a huge value of a stepper. Okay, so that's when you need to have great resolution, when you need to have great alignment, you will not get it with a contact printer if you have dies that have to be aligned all the way across that wafer. But you will have a much easier time getting that with a projection lithography because of all these things that I'm showing here, right? That project projection divides the errors down by whatever that projection ratio is. Okay, so there's the value of projection lithography. This is why Everyone in the transistor industry uses this, and this is why for those in uh, RF MEMS, or some type MEMS that needs to be small, uses uh, stepper type projection lithography. Okay, there's even more reasons than that. If I backtrack on this, I've got those other reasons here as well. Uh, let me save this first before I do that, okay? And so another reason is that if you have just a speck of dust right here, okay, what happens is that dust, by the time you get to this, right, becomes much smaller or is now out of focus, right? So in other words, most of these masks have the actual mask layer, and then they have a little bit of uh, glass or plastic above it here, right, that protects this layer from any dust particles. So you get a dust particle up here, and this is not drawn to scale, obviously. This is, this is actually much thicker than that. Now the dust particle is out of focus by the time it gets to this. These are in focus, the dust particle is not. So you actually can protect yourself somewhat from dust particles by doing this projection lithography. So in the end, you're seeing all these different lithography steep, uh, systems. Projection printing by far is the best to use. However, it's not the best if you have large topography. Okay, so think about this. You're, you're focusing it this down. So there is a very specific uh, region here where everything is in focus. Okay, so if I look at this, I could say, say that and that. This is the region. That's in focus. All right? If you get beyond this region, like if I go here, that's not out of focus. You're not going to get good resolution there. Okay, the reason why I'm telling you this is that because in a lot of MEMS processing, you have lots of topography, you have very thick layers. Okay, in transistor technology, you try to keep those layers as thin as possible in order to get the best resolution possible. Okay, but in MEMS, you could have some very, very thick layers. And your, your layers, right, maybe your MEMS layer looks like this relative to what I've drawn in the focus. Maybe your MEMS layers look like this. Okay, that's possible. So they're much thicker than the region of focus. Okay, in this case, how are you gonna do your lithography? Well, you don't have much of a choice. Maybe you have to do contact lithography, okay? So that's why for MEMS, contact lithography is still very, very useful. And so we have a tool like that in our micro lab here. Unfortunately, it's really bad. It should be replaced. But a lot of MEMS researchers don't care because, right, they're, they're doing, their alignments have to be 10 microns or so. They don't care. I care, but there's not much I could do about it because that's an expensive tool. So my group uses the ASML, which is, the most accurate tool that the MOS uh, people will use. And that creates friction, right? Because right, I told you, MEMS guys are dirty, MOS are clean. <laughs> and so it's that cleanliness that creates a little bit of friction, right? Different wafers being used on the same tool. Okay, but it's a necessity to use 
uh, projection printing if you are doing uh, very fine lines. But if you're not, a lot of times it's preference. The preference for MEMS is to use a contact aligner. Okay. Yes. It's the thickness of, yeah, when I'm drawing this, I really mean the thickness of the photoresist again. So I, I should have drawn that, right? So if the photoresist, see, in order to cover this, the photoresist has to be here. And so it actually has to be that thick. So that's your photoresist thickness. And so now, right, you have that focus going throughout that photoresist. You can't get straight sidewalls on photoresist, which we'll talk about in etching. It would be a big problem. And so, yeah, you're right. It, it's the photoresist thickness that's the problem. And a lot of times in MEMS, right, even in some of our processes, that could be six microns thick. And this depth of focus is a formula for this. Uh, the better your resolution, uh, the smaller that depth of focus becomes. Okay, so it automatically means that if you have large topography, it's going to be tough for you to get very good resolution. OK? Any other questions about lithography? I think this is my last slide on lithography here. Yes? Well, the wafer is, yeah, because the mask and lenses, that's a very expensive set, yeah. So the wafers usually moved around on that. Any other questions about lithography? So for those, like, some people say very fine nanometers? Yes, they use the step and repeat projection, and they're using, but they're, they're doing a lot more fancy stuff, right? So it's definitely deep UV or better, and they're, they're using phase shift masks and that sort of thing. So phase shift mass, I didn't have time to talk about. But it's basically something where, should I talk about this? I mean, a phase shift mask is, is sort of, if you have a feature on this mask, uh, you'll have, say, say you're trying to create this feature right here. Okay, but what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that the light that goes through here is phase shifted from the light that goes through here, maybe by 180 degrees. And so what happens with that is that if there's any bleed through of light, so the actual light profile that looks, that hits the wafer looks like that. Okay, if you phase shifted this, then it subtracts in this region and it creates that. Okay, so it actually gives you much better resolution than you otherwise could have gotten without the subtraction between those two sides. Okay, pretty simple concept. Uh, but one of the things people use is also they'll use special resist, all sorts of things going into getting 34 nanometer and better type stuff, right? Some of the stuff, you know, we may not even know. I couldn't even teach it because they don't tell us exactly what they're doing, right? That, that's the point where there's a lot of secrets there, right? The, the dielectric people use was secret for a long time, right? Um, that's really state of the art as best as you can do in transistor land. And that, that you, you'll learn some of that in 243 if you take that class. Okay, that's a good class to take. Um, okay, so if I move along here, let's talk now about another very important uh, topic for us, which is etching. And so what is etching? You pretty much know what that is. That's removable of material over designated areas of the wafer. Uh, to talk about etching, though, there are two very important metrics here that you must understand, and that is anisotropy or isotropy and selectivity. Okay, so what is anisotropy? Uh, well, first of all, let me define that by first talking about what, a, what an isotropic etch is. Not isotopic, but isotropic etch. Okay, most wet etches are isotropic. And so what that means is at, it's the same in all directions, right? Isotropic means same in all directions. And so if, if I'm doing an etch in a, in a film that used to be covering here and was covered by photoresist, I'm going to etch not only down into the wafer or into the film, but I'm also going to etch sideways. And if this etch is purely isotropic, it will etch exactly the same amount sideways as vertically. Okay? So most etches have a finite degree of isotropy or anisotropy. Okay, but if it's 100% isotropic, then I can define a few of these dimensions here. This is DF, which is the dimension of the etched, the lateral dimension of, of the etch front, well, of the etched feature here. And that's going to be equal to D, which is this dimension, plus two times the amount of vertical etch that occurred. Right? If, if that's an equation that's being satisfied, then that's 100% isotropic. 
Okay, then I can define a few things and say b is equal to this df minus d. And if b is equal to 2h, then this is isotropic. Right? But then I can keep going and say uh, if b is less than 2h, then it's partially isotropic, or we can call it anisotropic, partially anisotropic. Okay? And so people usually speak in terms of anisotropy. And so there's a definition for this, a sub f is equal to 1 minus b over 2h. Okay, that's equal to 0 if it's 100% isotropic. It's between 0 and 1 if you have a, an anisotropic or partially anisotropic etch. Okay, so anisotropic, purely anisotropic looks like this. Okay, where you only etch straight down into the substrate and there is no lateral etch at all. Okay, a lot of times this is what people are after. They want a purely anisotropic etch. So I should write that on this. So this is 100% anisotropic here. Okay? There's no etch like this. There's always going to be some degree of finite lateral etching going on. Uh, and so now let's talk about both of these things and, and understand why it is that both of these are so important. Okay, both anisotropy and selectivity. They pretty much define what kinds of features you can make uh, on any given wafer. So let's take this example here, which is an example you see in CMOS and MEMS uh, alike. Okay, so you may have silicon, you grew a silicon dioxide on this, you deposited a polycrystalline silicon on this, and then you put a photoresist above this. And you want to etch the polysilicon and only the polysilicon so that it ends up like this. Okay, this would be the ideal etch. You etch down, there's no attack of the photoresist. Okay. You have a perfectly anisotropic etch here that makes perfectly straight sidewalls in the polysilicon, and there's been no attack of the silicon dioxide. Okay, this is ideal. Perfect selectivity, perfect anisotropy. Okay. What actually happens is what's shown down here. Okay, it is not perfectly anisotropic. It doesn't etch only in the vertical direction, but as you're seeing here, it's etching in the lateral direction, which means it undercuts the photoresist a small amount. Okay? That could be disastrous for your process because depending on the degree of undercut, that's going to limit how small the feature size can be. Sometimes you can try to take advantage of that to get even smaller feature sizes if you have a lateral cut. In fact, that's what a lot of the device group used to do to get some of the uh, smallest gate transistors. They, they would actually lay out a certain feature size and then over etch, ash the PR to, to pull that feature size even smaller than we'd be practically able to do in an industry process. So universities could do this to investigate truly tiny channel length devices, but industry of course couldn't do this because this is not a very re repeatable process. right? Uh, but, but that's a problem in most cases where you have this lateral undercut. The other problem that you're seeing here is that once you finish etching that polysilicon, you start etching it in the silicon dioxide, which means that you're actually going to get um, some undercut in the silicon dioxide. And now you may stop me here and say, wait a minute, why would you do that? Right? That, seems, that doesn't seem very smart. Right? If, if you etch this, why don't you just stop once you hit the silicon dioxide? Okay. Well, one answer to that, it's tough to determine exactly what an etch rate is. Right? If you're off by just a little bit, uh, then maybe you don't etch all this polysilicon away. Right? So you don't know exactly your etch rate. But what if you did know exactly your etch rate and you had full control of that? Even if that were the case, you still could not do this for a practical device. Okay? And why is that? So let's talk about why that is. And here it is. This is more of a practical device here. Okay, in MOS processes, this is kind of an older one that's using this low-cost oxidation. But this oxide right here, and this is oxide, here and here, and that's polysilicon throughout there. You can see the photoresist there. This is silicon. That's the silicon substrate down here. Um, so in this process, you know, it looks the same as the one we did, had before, except because of this fat oxide here and very thin oxide here, 
you now have topography. Okay, and I, I warned you before that topography is not your friend, right? Yet here it is. That's topography. Those are regions where uh, you have thicker regions and then you have thinner regions here. All right, and you'll notice that this polysilicon film has been deposited over this topography the way polysilicon comes down, right? We, you've learned now that polysilicon comes down at around 600 degrees C. That's a high temperature, so it's conformal, right? Which means that if I had this topography and oxide to start with right here, if I had that topography to start with, the polysilicon is just going to mimic that topography there if it's perfectly conformal. Okay, and that's often what happens. Okay, and so, so what? We have polysilicon mimicking that. Who cares, right? You do care. And the reason why you care is because what are you trying to do? You, in the end, want to end up with a situation where you have only polysilicon here and all of this polysilicon is gone. All right? And so what's that going to take? Well, if this polysilicon were originally deposited, as it's shown here, to be 0.4 microns thick, so 400 nanometers thick, then you're going to have to etch all the way down through 400 nanometers of polysilicon. Okay, suppose you did that. Suppose you etched that 400 nanometers of polysilicon, and then you stopped right there because you knew exactly what your etch rate was, and you, knew, you can time it exactly. Okay, what do you end up with? Well, what you're going to end up with is all of the polysilicon removed in the flat portions, but you're going to end up with polysilicon still right here and right there. Okay, and the reason for that is because if you look at this, yes, this is 0.4 microns thick. But look at these portions here that have 45 degree angles. Okay, if you just go straight up from there because of that 45 degree angle, this thickness is actually thicker than all the other portions here. And that's happening just because of that topography and just because the deposition that occurred over that topography was completely conformal. Okay, so in the end, the thickness right here is square root of 2 times d, which was this thickness, 1.4 times d, 0.56 microns. Okay? So if I etch only 0.4 microns, I'm going to be left with these. And these are called stringers. They're called stringers because often they end up looking like just little strings of lines that are there. That look, they're very small. They look very innocent. But they can tie things together if it's a conductive layer that weren't supposed to be tied together. Okay? And so you need to get rid of these stringers. You have to remove. And must remove means you must overetch. You can't get around this overetch if you have topography and if you had a conformal deposition of polysilicon. Yes? So the etching does happen normal to the surface. So the etching is happening only in this direction. But if I etch in this direction, I'm going through 0.4 microns. If I etch in this direction, if I go 0.4 microns, I'm only going to reach there. Oh, so, so what I'm saying is that even though there's a slant, your etch doesn't actually have no. normal. No. Well, OK, no. OK, so, so yeah. So I need to be careful with what I'm saying. I'm assuming an anisotropic etch. OK, do I say that anywhere here? I guess I don't. Yeah, so here let's assume, which is always going to be the case for reasons we'll talk about, right? Because with an anisotropic etch, that's where you get good resolution. If it's not anisotropic, you know, we talk about that undercut, then you, your, your features are not the same as what you laid out, right? So you always want an anisotropic etch. Anisotropic etch. Okay? So if it is isotropic, you will remove all of this stuff. But you'll also not be able to resolve this, right? If it's isotropic, if I etch down this much, right, this distance is less than the thickness of that. So that, this feature will be gone, right? So it has to be an isotropic etch in order just to get this feature. Uh, but the problem with that is you have to over etch in order to get that, get rid of these stringers, OK? So the question becomes, how much over etch do we have to do? And so you can easily calculate that, right? So uh, you have to overetch at least 40%, because a 40% 40, 40 overetch means you take this 0.4 times that 0.4, 
that's 0.16 microns more of polysilicon, and that's how much more we need to get 0.56 microns polysilicon etched. Okay? So you need to overetch at least 40% here. And so, okay, great, we overetch. So what? Right? No problem. We'll just overetch. Okay? There's where selectivity comes in. Right? Because if you're overetching this just to get rid of the, this polysilicon here, that means you're now etching exposed oxide. Right. And if your etchant etches that oxide by a finite rate, there's a chance you're going to remove all that oxide. And that oxide is supposed to stay there. It's supposed to be there. If this were a transistor, right, you want that gate oxide to stay there. Okay? And so let's see what happens here. So this is where we have to talk about selectivity. All right, so what is selectivity? So here's a definition right here. Selectivity of A to B is equal to the etch rate of whatever that etchant is in A to A divided by the etch rate of whatever that etchant is to B. Okay? That's very simple. So if I say for a wet polysilicon etch, which we'll talk about a little later on, um, this is part of its com composition here. Uh, it, it'll be 15 to 1 selectivity. That means it'll etch 15 uh, polysilicon, well, 15 times faster in polysilicon than it will in silicon dioxide. Okay, so if the etch rate is one micron per minute, um, then I could do 15 microns of polysilicon will etch to every one micron of oxide that will etch. It's not going to be that fast, of course. Uh, the selectivity of, in, in a wet etch of polysilicon to photoresist uh, is very high. I'm not even going to give a number for it, right? The wet with photoresists are usually designed such that etchants don't attack them. They're not always successful at that, but for wet etchants, they're pretty successful with that. So the wet etchant won't attack the photoresist, but what it will do is it'll this photoresist will soak up the wet, and then its adhesion to the surface may not be so good. So usually for wet etchants, you can't do those forever either with photoresist. Right? You can do maybe a maximum of 30 minutes in photoresist, and then by that time, it's not that the photoresist has eroded away. It's just it's that it can't stick to the substrate anymore, and it just peels away. Okay, so even wet etchants are limited. Yes? Is wet etch is basically isotropic. Yeah. And so this example, that I'm just giving an example for an etchant here, but you wouldn't want to use a wet etch to do the etch that, for our example. Right, but you will want to do a wet etch for other types of etches. And so when I talk about release etches, we love isotropic etches in MEMS. Right, we love both anisotropic and isotropic because isotropic is the way we release structures. Okay, and we'll, we'll show that uh, later on. Uh, for dry etches, which is more in line with what we need for the present example, right, here's what we have. We have a uh, regular RIE type process with the uh, chemistry we'll talk about a little later on polysilicon to silicon dioxide from 5 to 7 to 1. Okay? That's not that great. Right? There are other etchers. Uh, the, the selectivity of polysilicon to PR is 4 to 1. Right? That seems a little backwards. Right? The, the photoresist can't even stand up to the polysilicon etch so well with a regular RIE. Okay? Luckily, there are other types of etches that you can, dry etches you can do on polysilicon. There's an ECR etch that's electron cyclotron resonance type etch where they use a, a, a higher frequency plasma, a microwave type plasma there. You can get 30 to 1 of selectivity. Then there's the Bosch process, the deep reactive ion etching that we'll talk about. We can do 100 to 1 or better. Okay, so there's a lot of good etches out there that could give you very good selectivity. But let's, for the case of argument, just try one of these etches here first on that example that we've been looking at. Okay, so if the selectivity, well, a little better than that, what if our selectivity for polysilicon to silicon dioxide was 8 to 1? Okay. Then, if we had a 40% overetch, if we needed to do that 40% overetch, then we can just calculate that. That's going to be 0.16 microns of polysilicon. Divide that by 8 because of that 8 to 1. That's 20 nanometers of oxide. And if we go back here and see how much oxide, we had 10 nanometers of gate oxide. Okay. Oxide's gone. Right? Just because we had to overetch to get rid of this, we have etched through that oxide in half of the time, and now we're etching into silicon. 
So you're going to end up now in that etch with big, deep grooves right here. It's going to be ugly. Right? You're going to have this. Big holes in your silicon. And of course, for a transistor device, that kills it. Right? That's bad news right there. Okay, so that illustrates how important selectivity is in all of these things. And so with better selectivity, if we had 30 to 1, like the electron cyclotron resonance etching, uh, which you can t contain with a high density plasma, 40% over etch, 0.16 divided by 35.3 nanometers. That's better. I, mean, I, I don't like it either. Right? We had 10 nanometers of oxide there. Now there's only 5 nanometers of oxide there. But it's still there. We haven't attacked the silicon. This MOS device will probably still survive. Um, but I'd like better. And there are etch recipes that are better. So there's where selectivity matters in a big way. Okay. So that's why these two things, anisotropy and selectivity, they are the most important things to worry about when dealing with these etching problems and when designing a process flow, which is something you're going to have to do later on in this course. Right? I'm going to give you some cross-section, or I'll give you some 3D picture of some device, and you're going to have to tell me what you're going to do to make that device. And you better choose the right etching methods to achieve that device. Right? You choose the wrong one, you try to wet etch something, device is going to be gone, right? And so you need to understand this very well. Okay, so let's talk about the different specific etchings, right? We talked about anisotropy. We talked about uh, selectivity. Let's now talk about the etchings. And so first, let's start with wet etching. So in wet etching, it's exactly what you think it is, right? You'll have a beaker or some kind of container that contains a solution uh, that's made to etch whatever film you want to etch that's selective to that film. And right, you're just dipping the wafer into that liquid solution, and that liquid is etching this thing. Okay, so the basic mechanism is exactly the same as all of our different mechanisms for even deposition of things, right? You have a reactant now, the reactant has to diffuse to the surface, um, it has to react with the surface, it has to react with the surface in a way that whatever byproducts are there dissolve in solution and go away, right? For any etch recipe, that's an important thing. Any byproducts you make, and there's always byproducts, right? They better be able to be swooshed out of there. Okay? Yes? Oh, that, so PR, if you etch for too long, there's a problem with wet etching. So I'm saying if you etch for too long, like if you keep this in, in this wet solvent for more than 30 minutes, photoresist starts soaking up some of that solvent. Right? And it starts becoming not hard anymore, but very soft. And it can peel off. Right? It'll lose adhesion to the, to the substrate. So a lot of times that happens. I won't say that it happens for every single etching solution. I'll tell you, especially HF, it definitely happens. Hydrofluoric acid, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you always want to, well, even if it's not in motion, you want those byproducts to dissolve, OK? Uh, but sometimes, and we'll talk about this later, sometimes the byproduct is a gas. You may think, oh, great, a gas, right? It just go away. Not necessarily in a liquid, right? A gas can just blow a bubble. Okay, and when it blows that bubble, that means it's shielding that region from more reactants to come in, right? So that actually could be a big problem. And so. Uh, you shake it. So it's exactly what you're thinking. When you're doing a wet etch, don't just drop the wafer in there and walk away. <laughs> don't do that. Okay, I've had people do that. And you know, it takes a long time to figure out what they're doing wrong, because you never think that anyone would do that. At least I don't, right? But people will do it. They'll just drop it in there. And OK, well, 30 minutes, I'll go do whatever, get on the computer, whatever, and then come back. And oh, something's wrong. It's not, I didn't release my structure, right? You've got to agitate that thing. Okay, so you stand there, put the work in, do this kind of stuff, right? Or, you know, put in a beaker with a magnetic thing on, you know, you, you know those hot plates that have the spinning magnet thing? Put the spinning magnet in there and stir that thing up, right? Get some agitation in there. Yes? So the ones where we do, like, a, a focus set of uh, wafers, yeah. doesn't that have some kind of an agitation going on? Yeah, so the... I would still agitate a little bit, right? Every now and then I would agitate. Yeah, so some of those sinks, uh, um, well, that's for rinses usually, right? But for your etching, yeah, for rinses, they'll, they'll, they'll flow the water. 
which is a good thing, right? But for etches, usually that's, that's in some beaker or in some kind of container where the water, the, the solvent is not flowing because you don't have enough solvent to do that, right? You don't want to flow that solvent continuously. So usually you have some beaker and you're, you know, with a cassette of wafers, usually it's not a cassette of wafers, and then it's a dye, right? You don't want to release your whole wafer just yet, so you put a dye or parts of a wafer in there and you know, you've got it in some kind of holder and you're just going up and down and sloshing it back and forth. And if you don't do the sloshing, don't be surprised if you don't release your device. Right? That's very important in this. I'm going to teach you a lot of important things with this. I, we're only starting here. So, so all these questions, I'm, I'm actually have slides that talk about these things. Uh, so there's many processes by which wet etching can occur. Right? It could be simple as dissolution of the film in the solvent solution. So that's very simple, right? just like a powder just dissolving into it. But usually it involves one or more chemical reactions. And a lot of times there's an oxidation reduction where you form a layer of oxide first and then you react away the oxide. Okay, so sometimes it's a two-step process where it doesn't immediately attack whatever's on the substrate. It turns it into an oxide first, and then it gets rid of the oxide. Okay, two-step types of etching. So what are the advantages of wet etching? Very high throughput, right? You could have a large cassette of wafers and put the whole cassette in there, get some agitation going in there. All those wafers etched all at once. It's a very fast process, too, relative to dry etches. For most dry etches versus wet etches, the wet etches are faster. Okay, uh, excellent selectivity usually. So usually it's chemical, right? So it's going to attack only one film. It's not going to attack many of the others unless those two films are very, very similar. Uh, they have limitations in wet etching, and this is why wet etching is, is used only for certain purposes. The biggest limitation is you have greater than three micron features. Well, you're limited to sort of greater than three micron features because Right, I guess that depends on how thick your, your film is, right? This varies with film thickness, but right, if you're going to undercut that film, uh, you're not going to get good resolution, right? So you're going to, maybe this is your film here, and then this is your photoresist above that film. Whoops, I drew that wrong. Maybe that's your feature right here. And so how is this going to etch? The etch is going to go like this, that, that, that. It's going to do the same thing on the other side. And you can see by the time you've cleared that, you have nothing under that photoresist anymore. Okay? So that's what limits this dimension. It's, it's a function of this. But I would say as a general rule, if you have features that are less than 3 microns, forget about it. All right? Use a dry etch to get those features. Um, I'll say this is also an advantage of wet etching because you watch what I just did, right? This is what you need to do in MEMS, right? In MEMS, you don't want this film under a structure. You want to suspend that structure. So you like this etch that goes down and across exactly the same rate because that means you're going to be able to undercut that. You can't do good undercutting with an RIE etch. Even a plasma etch, it's tough to do with. But wet etches, they're great. Okay, you have a higher cost of etchants and DI water compared with dry etch, so uh, gas expenses. So, right, think about it. After you etch, you have to rinse the thing with DI water. That's a lot of water, lots of throughput of water going through this. And believe it or not, that's very expensive for labs. That's why in our lab, if we had a choice, we'd stay at two inches, two inch wafers. Right, but you notice we're at eight inches. Why are we at eight inches? Right, that's costing us more money. Now we're at eight inches because the industry is making the best tools at that size. Right? They don't make great tools at two inches because no one needs them. Right? So we have to keep increasing in size to keep up with the tools that industry is making. We don't like it, though, because that means it costs more to do anything in the lab because the wafers are bigger, the amounts of solutions necessary to clean things are bigger. Everything is bigger, so everything costs more. Okay? We'd rather be at two inches, but we just can't. Uh, safety is another issue with wet etching. So obviously it's chemicals. So it could be some pretty hazardous stuff, especially HF. If, if you go into the lab, they'll scare the heck out of you with HF, and they should actually, because HF is insidious. Right? There are some acids you get it on you, you know immediately because, boy, it hurts. Right? HF well, it's, it gets on. You may know it's on. You may not. Right? But if you don't clean it out, then over a few days, suddenly your finger is gone. Right? <laughs> or something like that. So HF is pretty bad. It's pretty insidious. And you know, safety is a big issue with wet etches. 
another reason why people like to avoid them. Uh, exhaust fumes, potential for explosion, right? Always perform these under a hood and resist adhesion problems, which I have discussed already, okay? Um, some other wet etching limitations, and here's, here's where we're talking about wetting, okay? So incomplete wetting of the surface is also possible. So if you're doing a wet etch, okay, the first thing you should do is just not take your wafer and say, oh, great, there's my etching solution, let's go in, right? It seems that it should be that simple. Never do that, okay? Never go straight into your wet etching solution. Okay, always first go into DI water. Okay? Why do you want to do that? You want to do that because you want to wet the surface with the DI water. Right? DI water will probably wet your surface better than the solvent that you're etching in. Take it out of the DI water, then go into the etchant. Okay, if you do that, there's a better chance that the etchant will uniformly uh, coat your wafer and will etch everywhere in a uniform manner. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. If you're going to etch anything with a wet etch solution, go into DI water first. Okay, and it all has to do with this wetting, right? If you don't wet correctly, you have pockets where etching hasn't occurred, and your yield will drop like a rock. Okay, um, let's see. For some etches, solution, yeah, so there it is, DI water first. So here's the other one, bubble formation. Okay, this is where agitation is very, very important. So if one of the byproducts of the etch is a gas, that gas may not just dissolve into solution, it may just form a bubble here. Right? And if I form a bubble here, then you're etching here, but you're not etching there. And in the end, you're going to have a very non-uniform etch, and your yield is going to be bad. Okay? And so the solution to this, like we discussed, is to agitate the wafers during the reaction. Do not just let the wafers sit there, have some kind of agitation going on. Okay, this is definitely a problem with aluminum etching. When you etch aluminum, you can actually see the bubbles forming there. And you really have to shake that thing to make sure you have a uniform etch if you're wet etching aluminum. Okay, so some common wet etch chemistries. Uh, this is wet etching silicon. So silicon, nitric acid, hydrofluoric acid. How does this work? Well, first of all, I should say hydrofluoric acid is what's used to etch oxide. Okay, so this is one of those things where the nitric acid comes in, forms a silicon dioxide layer, and then the hydrofluoric acid comes in and etches the silicon dioxide. Okay, this is a two-step reaction if you're using this to etch silicon. Okay, this is not the only silicon etchant out there. We'll talk about some others like KOH or so, but this one happens to operate this way. And different mixture combinations, percentages of these can yield different uh, etch rates here. Yes? Yes, that's right, yeah. That's right, yeah. You, you do not use this to try to etch silicon over oxide. Okay, but we'll show some other etches where you can do that. Why is my computer not advancing? Okay. Um, and so we'll talk about that right now. So let's talk a little bit about crystal orientation. Uh, so in silicon, right, silicon is not an isotropic material. Silicon's atoms are actually oriented uh, in what we can call planes, uh, where if you look at, at, at your silicon piece at different angles, you'll see different numbers of silicon atoms on the surface. Okay, and you can kind of define a number of different planes in the silicon, and the way that we define them is using a coordinate system like this. So if you look at a little box of atoms like this, and these are just definitions that I'm giving you, uh, you first find the vector that corresponds to 100. So the 100 silicon plane can be found as the plane that is perpendicular to the 100 vector. Okay, so 100 vector, so you go 1 down the x, 0 and y, 0 and z, the vector is this one here, right? There's my vector, there's the plane that's perpendicular to the vector, that's my 100 plane. Okay, other examples here, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, that's the vector, the plane is oriented that way and so on and so forth for all these other. Here's 1, 1, 1 right here. Okay, so we define planes in silicon using these uh, vector times of coordinate systems. Silicon is actually not as simple as just these little boxes here. It's what's called an FCC. It was two merged FCC cells that are offset by A over 4, where A is the distance between some of the atoms in the FCC cell. And so it's a pretty complex structure like this. Uh, but you can still define a 111 plane, a 110, and a 100. And if you look at the silicon off of these different planes that you're seeing up here, 
you'll see different numbers of silicon atoms, which means different number of bonds okay, that have to be broken in order to do an etch. Okay, so what does that tell you? That tells you that a certain etchant is probably not going to be able to etch silicon at the same rate along different planes. Okay, and so what that tells you is that it is possible to get a very anisotropic etch using a wet etching solution by just looking at the different planes. So anisotropic etches are available through wet etching in single crystal silicon by taking advantage of the orientation dependence of the etching. So if I have a 111 plane, I have a much denser packing of silicon atoms along that plane than a 100 plane will have. And so because I have to remove more atoms to get at that 111 plane, that etch rate is slower than it is in 100, and it's much slower. Okay? And so in solvents like KOH plus isopropyl alcohol with this kind of percentage here, etch rate in 100 could be 100 times more than the etch rate in 111. Right? That's pretty darn good selectivity right there, which tells you that you can get very anisotropic etches. So here are things you can do. Right? Depending on what surface you start out with, if you start out um, with a 100 surface, in this case here, and you, depending on how you do your mass to, to define your photoresist, which then defines this silicon dioxide. So notice this etch is not being done with photoresist to protect the silicon. That's because the photoresist will float away for a long etch. These can be very long etches because they're very deep. Okay? You use an oxide, silicon dioxide, as a hard mask for you that sticks to the silicon better. But if you do that, then you can etch this in such a way that this front will move very fast because it's 100. But adjacent to the 100 plane are these 111 planes. And along these 111 planes, no etching occurs. Well, etching occurs but at a very slow rate, right? 100 times slower etching occurs. So effectively, no etching occurs, right? And so you're able to get these very well-defined angles here. Right? It turns out you can, you can get 54.7 degree angles very easily by doing these anisotropic KOH type etches. You could even basically get the etch to stop at a certain depth. So that's what's happening right here. It's gone through all the 11 or all the 100, but then it's reached the 111 planes out here and it just stops. Okay? Because it, you know, it's not stopped. It's still etching the 111 plane, but it's doing it so slowly that as far as you're concerned, it stopped there. Pull the wafer out you get a nice V groove. Right? This is actually what people are using to make some high power CMOS devices, for example. Yes? Uh, there's an oxide uh, isotropy also. Uh, what do you mean by the oxide isotropy? So, um, so you have a No. Yeah, so when you grow, see the oxide usually is grown at, as, it's not a crystalline. Oxide is amorphous okay. in the end. So it's not really a crystalline structure that you're growing above the silicon. And so, yeah, it has no, it's, an, it's isotropic pretty much. Yes? So do oxides grow at different rates? Different yes. Yeah, so oxides will grow at different rates. That's why you see, uh, uh, and, and they also grow different percentage into the silicon. So I remember I, I gave uh, that thing where I showed if this is your silicon surface, you'll grow this much oxide, that much oxide above. I don't know what I had. Did I have 46% and, and, and yeah, whatever, 54%. You'll see other books that have 44% uh, and 66%, and right? And those differences are happening because they're assuming different starting surfaces on the silicon. So you will grow oxide at different rates above silicon, yes. Oh no, th see this started out 100, right? Start out at 100. Yeah, so this was a wafer that was 100 everywhere on its surface. Yep. And this is just what the etching front looks like after a certain amount of time. So I'm assuming I've etched this for a certain amount of time here. This one hasn't finished, right? By the time this one gets that, you're going to have a V groove that stops right at the V here too. And it's all dependent on how wide I made this feature, okay? Yeah, you'll, you'll have a chance to really enjoy this in your homework assignment because you, this, uh, and, and these problems actually can get very, very hairy, actually. 
You have to really think because you have to think about where the planes are in the silicon. And that's not uh, an easy thing to do sometimes. So those could be some of the most confusing problems that you'll ever encounter. I don't think the problem we gave you is too confusing yet, but we have some more in store later on when you actually do MEMS type, type stuff. Okay? And now, you could even do things like this. If you start out with a 110 plane, right, you can get pretty much straight 90 degree sidewalls on this. Right? Very nice stuff. Right? But who wants to start with 110 wafers? Right? They're very rare. Some people might want to. Right? But your, wafer, your starting wafer cost may be a little more expensive with that. Okay? Okay, so let's get back to wet etching. So there's wet etching of silicon dioxide. I think we've already said hydrofluoric acid does this. Um, I guess this is also a way I can illustrate one more thing, and that's that you know, when you're etching things like contact holes, which is often something you want to etch, especially in CMOS, right? In CMOS, you have to etch these contact holes so that you can make contact between a metal and your junction, uh, right, in all CMOS type devices. Now, the thing is, these contact holes have been getting smaller and smaller with time. And so there's something we'll talk about later on in this course in great depth, but there's a surface tension to every liquid. Okay? And if that surface tension is, is such that this liquid can't wet this surface here. Right? So even though you have liquid above this, this is a bubble right here that remains dry. Right? Because the surface tension is, is not allowing this thing to go in and cover all of this. Okay, this has to do with contact angle. It has to do with a lot of things that we will discuss later on in the class. But I think I'll just say right now that one of the solutions to this is to add a surfactant to the etchant. So you add a surfactant to hydrofluoric acid, Triton X. Right? What's a surfactant? Laundry detergent right, is a surfactant. Right? That's why laundry detergent detergent's so good. Right? It goes in and it coats everything. Right? So you're doing a similar sort of thing right here. That improves the ability of HF to get in here, wet the surface, and you finally etch that native oxide that you usually have to do in CMOS processing to make sure that you have uh, good contacts. Right? If you start processing CMOS in the lab here, this is going to be your biggest headache here to actually make that contact. Because you can go through a multi-mask process, and the very last step is that contact etch. And so you try to etch those contacts, and you put the metal down, and then you see there are open circuits. Right. What was wrong? You didn't get rid of that native oxide there because your wet dip didn't work. Okay, that happens in MEMS processes too. Um, the other thing that surfactants can do is they can suppress the formation of certain etch byproducts, okay, which could slow the reaction or get an incomplete reaction somewhere. So actually, surfactants have become very important in ULSI type uh, processes. Uh, so more wet etch chemistries. So silicon nitride, you can etch using a hot phosphoric acid. That's 85% phosphoric acid at 100 degrees C. Uh, etch rate 10 nanometers per minute is very slow, but the beauty of this is that it has almost infinite selectivity to nitride versus oxide. Okay, so in CMOS, this is something people used to do a lot when they did locos, which required oxide over, sorry, nitride over oxide, where the nitride had to be removed. Uh, after time, you know, actually when I ran my CMOS processes when I was a grad student, I would, you know, to get rid of the nitride, do an overnight etch. Just put it in the hot phosphoric, uh, put it in the hot phosphoric acid um, overnight. And, you know, I wouldn't worry about how fast the oxide's being etched because there was enough oxide there that it would, I knew it would survive even that long a hot phosphoric etch. Um, let's see, aluminum etch. Here's just an aluminum etching solution. Similar type of uh, etching that we saw before. Forms an oxide first with the HNO3, and then the phosphoric acid comes in and dissolves the alumina that then forms after that. Okay. Problems, uh, I mentioned this with aluminum. You get a lot of hydrogen gas bubbles that come out. Uh, they adhere firmly to the surface, so you have to overetch a lot, and you have to really mechanically agitate in order to make sure that these bubbles aren't sticking there and preventing a lot of etching. Um, and so, you know, for wet etching, there's a lot of work done on wet etches where, actually there was a guy, Kurt Williams, he was one of my contemporaries in the lab. He published a paper that basically went through different types of material, different types of etchants, and recorded the etch rate 
in these different types of materials. This is great stuff that Kurt did, a great service to the community. This is one of the most referenced papers, or at least most used papers around. Right? Just simple looking at different etch rates and publishing that ended up being extremely useful to a lot of people uh, across the world. Uh, the unfortunate thing, though, is that not all of these are correct because your conditions may vary. Right? It's not that he, he did, he's lying about any of these etch rates. It's because in his situation, right, depending on how you deposit it, that sort of thing, what your etching solution is, they may not be exactly the same as what he's got here. Okay? So you can use this kind of to help yourself design a process. But you know, when you're running a process, trust no one. Okay? Don't even trust any of these etch rates here. Determine that etch rate for yourself first. Make sure of it before you run the whole process. Okay? And this is just a little more here, etch chemistries here, but this is showing wet etchants here, how fast they can etch. This is also kind of looking at the next topic we're going to talk about, which is dry etching. Okay, so in dry etching, um, it's also etching. You can see the different rates of etching here. In some cases, wet etching can be a lot faster. Uh, but in dry etching, you have more control over the lateral etch. Okay, so for that reason, uh, in CMOS, there's very little use of wet etching, actually, except for making sure your contacts are open. You do a final wet dip after that, but most of the etching is done using dry etching. In MEMS, there is a lot of wet etching, uh, not to define your features, but to release devices. And we'll talk about those specific processes later on. But right now, let's talk about dry etching. And so let's first talk about what's needed to do a dry etch. So, Pretty much dry etching oftentimes means you're employing a plasma. Okay? And so you can dry etch by either physical sputtering, which is physically removing material uh, through impact with it. And then there's something called plasma etching. And then there's something called reactive ion etching, all of them based on plasma processes, which means you have to create a plasma. So all of these systems are going to have characteristics defined by something like this. You've got two electrodes here. Your wafer may be on one of the electrodes. You'll strike a plasma between these electrodes by putting a high field between them, uh, sometimes using RF power for that, and most of the times using RF power now. And what this does is it creates ions. So what a plasma is, right, is a cloud of ions. And those ions were created because when you put this energy in, you had inelastic collisions uh, with some of the energetic electrons uh, that then has an avalanche effect to remove even more electrons from even more atoms. Right? So you basically create a gas of atoms that are at all sorts of different charges. Right? Positive charges, some of them even neutral. Right? And then what you do, what you can do later on is once you develop the charge in this, so you develop a negative bias usually here. What that does is it pushes the positive ions away from here toward this side. Now you've got more positive here than the ground negative here. And that creates an electric field that can push the ions towards your wafer. And so in that case, you can use that electric field to direct the ions toward the wafer. And that's how you can get directionality in your etch. Okay? So the way that we're getting directionality is by using ions to bombard that wafer. Okay? Uh, so that's the bottom line of all of this dry etching. So now let's start talking about these different things here. So first, physical sputtering, often called ion milling, right? Because it really is just like milling. You're, you're just bombarding the substrate with highly energetic ions. And then you're physically, it's physical momentum transfer that is knocking off the molecules from the layer below it. And so it's highly directional, right? You give the ions energy and directionality using the E fields, right? Ions, of course, they're charged. You can apply an E field across them and give them lots of energy to push them straight down into the substrate. Uh, of course, it's highly directional because you're using the, those E fields to push them straight into the substrate, so very anisotropic. This is one of the most anisotropic etches you're going to get. Okay, so here's just a picture of it. There's your photoresist. There's your film. You're going straight down. And you're just blasting this film out of the way, and the photoresist is protecting the film in these areas. Okay, great. What's the problem? Why don't we always do this? Okay, the problem is selectivity. Okay, if you're in a, if there's no chemical reaction involved with this, those ions they don't care what they're hitting. They're going to hit it. They're going to remove it. Right? Doesn't matter whether it's photoresist. Doesn't matter whether it's your film. 
Doesn't matter whether it's the film underneath your film, the etch rate of everything is going to be about the same. Okay, so it's going to be very hard to stop. Okay, so problems with iron milling. So, first one here photoresist, other masking material, material below your film are etched almost exactly at the same rate as the film to be etched. Very poor selectivity. Right? And in our discussion of the importance of selectivity, where topography, anywhere you have topography and in MEMS, you're going to have a lot of it. Iron milling will not work for you, right? Because you just can't do the overetch necessary to get rid of those stringers. Okay, the other problem with iron milling is that since it's not a chemical reaction, it is physically just bombarding things apart. So I got an iron that comes down, it hits, out comes my byproduct. Okay? That byproduct is a piece of solid material. How far is that byproduct going to go? Right? Hopefully it goes up and it's small enough that the gas stream can collect it. Okay? But if not, it comes out, then it deposits somewhere else. Okay? And it's that deposition somewhere else that with iron milling can end up having you know, things called grass, right? where most of that stuff gets etched down, but then you end up with spikes of things coming out. Right? These are the first nanotubes right? that were made by <laughs> Well, you didn't really want to make them, but you end up with these grass at the bottom of your wafer right there. Right? And so iron milling does this. Some RIE will do this as well. And grass is no good. right? You don't want grass down. Well, maybe you do. right? If you're doing nano stuff and you want certain properties, maybe you like this. Right? Maybe this is a good idea to make some nanostructures or so. But that's one of the problems. But the biggest problem is selectivity, though. Okay, because of selectivity, very rare that you're going to do iron milling. You're almost always going to do some kind of plasma etching or reactive ion etching. So let's talk about plasma etching right now. And so in plasma etching, right, you're, you're going to strike your plasma, so your gas glow discharge creates reactive species that chemically react with the film to be etched. Okay? So the key here is that you're using the plasma to create a very reactive species that would not be that reactive without the plasma. Okay? And the result could be much better selectivity. But the etch, in a true plasma etch, the etch is fairly isotropic. Okay, it's only when you do what's called reactive ion etching that you get an anisotropic etch. But a pure plasma should be very isotropic. It's like a gaseous etch. Okay, so let's talk about the plasma etching mechanism. So here's a mechanism. You have the plasma. Uh, your reactive species right here is generated. Then it has to diffuse to the surface. So this is how you model plasma etching, which we're not going to do here, but which you can do in 243. Right, that species gets to the, uh, the surface here. It adsorbs to the surface. You get a chemical reaction. You get a byproduct. And again, the most important step is that that byproduct will dissolve from the surface and can be carried away. And, and that's basically it. That's your plasma etch. But it's not nearly that simple. Okay, so a lot of people like to say, you know, when they call it reactive ion etch or plasma etch, plasma is a gas of ions. So it must be the ions that are doing the etch. No. It's generally not the ions doing the etch. So here's an example of a chemistry for plasma etching. This is polysilicon etching using CF4 and O2. Okay, so here's what happens. You take your CF4 gas at a certain concentration. You strike the plasma. The plasma is putting energy into that gas, and it's turning that gas into all sorts of different ions and radicals. Okay, so you have all these ions, CF4+, plus, CF4. CF3, CF2, all these positive ions, which you can then direct into the substrate if you want to. But in a plasma etch, you don't direct into the substrate. Okay, what you do is you've created um, a neutral radical that this arrow is not pointing at for some reason. <laughs> I've got to fix that right now. You create a, neut a neutral rea radical right there. I've used this thing time and time again, and I don't <laughs> I don't know how I missed that in the previous ones. Uh, but yeah, there's your neutral radical right here. right? No atom likes to be neutral, right? Fluorine especially. Where's, what does fluorine come as naturally? F2, right? It wants to combine with another one, and that puts it in its lowest energy state. right? Nothing wants to be in a high energy state. And so that's exactly the case here. If you can get an atom to be in a state where it's not combined with another one, it's completely neutral, it's going to hate that, right? And so it's going to take every opportunity possible to react with something that gets it into a more stable, lower energy state. Okay? And so that's exactly what's going to happen here. This neutral radical is going to come in, and it's going to form 
uh, these compounds out of silicon. Okay, these are volatile compounds. What reacts with the silicon, these are volatile compounds, they will go away. Okay, and this is how dry etching occurs. It does not occur in general because these ions are there reacting with anything. It occurs because you create these neutral radicals that are so unstable that hate living, right, and that need to go somewhere else and convert to something else. Okay, that's what's really happening. So because of this, right, this is all a gas. You're putting a gas on this. If this is the only thing doing the etch, this thing is everywhere, right? It's going to go laterally and vertically at the same rate. So a true plasma etch is usually very isotropic. Okay, so when someone says, I'm going to plasma etch something, usually they're talking about a, an isotropic etch. Okay, it's not until you get to what's called reactive ion etching. Well, okay, so I, I'm talking about iso so isotropic etching. Also, formation of a polymer can occur in this, right? And a polymer can be trouble uh, because it be trouble and good. We'll see we're going to use it later on. But if a polymer forms on this, you can get a, a layer forming on top of this that just prevents the etch from occurring, okay? If it's, a, if it's just a plasma etch, that's trouble because then your etch is going to stop and you can't continue. Uh, but what we'll see that we take great advantage of this formation of the polymer in reactive ion etching. Okay, so let's now talk about reactive ion etching. This is where you can get both a selective etch and a directional etch, so it can be very anisotropic because you take advantage of the two things you get with this plasma. Right? The one thing you get with the plasma is you get these neutral radicals that are highly reactive. Okay, the other thing you get with the plasma is these ions that you can now use to bombard the surface, right? Just the way that we did physical sputtering, except this time we're going to bombard the surface without as much energy, okay? And so the result is a directional anisotropic etching. So RIE is kind of a misnomer. It's not the ions that react, right? When you say reactive ion etching, you think, oh, okay, well, my ions are reacting. No, that's completely wrong. It has nothing to do with ions reacting. It's the neutral species that still dominate the reaction. The ions just enhance the reaction in certain directions. Okay, so there's two postulated mechanisms, or there's two mechanisms behind RIE. One of them is called the surface damage mechanism. The other one's called the surface inhibitor mechanism. And here now is the surface damage mechanism. So in this, what's occurring here is you're striking your plasma. That means you're creating these reactive radicals. Okay, but these reactive radicals are not reactive enough in this case, in this particular chemistry for this surface damage mechanism to actually react with the exposed film. Okay, they may get to the exposed film, but then they'll, they won't react. Okay, they may react a little bit, but not enough. Okay, in order to help that reaction, you need to hurt that film. You need to loosen up that film a bit, right? And then the film can be etched, right? It's like you trying to open a jar, you give it to someone else, they, right, they open it and you say, oh, I loosen it up for you. Right? Well, that's what these ions are doing. Right? They're loosening up the surface here. They're, they're damaging the thing. When you damage it, you're lowering the activation energy for these radicals to come in and react. And so you can see how if you take the, you know, these ions and you bombard the surface, you can be very directional so that you only damage the top surface. You're not damaging the edges here. And therefore, the only etch that occurs is the top surface, and you go straight down. You don't etch sideways, you go straight down. Okay, of course, there's limits to how much you could do this, right? Because some of these ions can go here, bounce off, and hit the side edges, still do some damage. So no plasma etch is completely anisotropic going straight down. They'll go a little bit sideways, but you have much better anisotropy than other etches. Yes? No, a lot of times you want the rectangular. At least in, in, in a lot of the stuff my group does, and I think a lot of other groups, you want these straight sidewalls. Uh, and you'll see that later on why, because a lot of times we're using the capacitance between those sidewalls. And to define a very good capacitance, we need them straight. Uh, you are right for some other applications. You don't want that corner because it's a high stress point. So sometimes you want to smooth that out. But on the sidewalls, a lot of times you want them straight. If you, you're right, too, also, that in a lot of products, like in MOS, right, when you're doing vias to make contacts, you don't want straight sidewalls. You want it sloped like this. 
And so that sloping, you can see, you can control with this process as well. Right? So you can change your parameters, change the voltage between these, right? change a few things, and you can actually get slope sidewalls at the same time. Okay? So this is one way to do this. You get etching at the surface, not much etching at the sidewalls. The other way we'll talk about next time actually employs the polymer. And it actually grows a polymer everywhere. And then the ions come down and break up the polymer. Once the polymer is broken up, etching can occur straight down. Okay, but we'll talk about that next time, which is on Tuesday. Okay, so we're through.